What does it mean to truly be yourself? Many of us will spend a lifetime searching for our true identity, chasing an ideal job, pursuing an endless education, or finding that perfect lover. But sometimes we hold ourselves back. Fears, social norms, illness, or even our own internal conflicts. Many of us will spend a lifetime reluctant to chase after our dreams. Scared of what others may think, fearful of society will accept us, and afraid to let loose. But sometimes a single moment in time can change how we see the world. And inspiration can be found in an instant. It is said that humans can experience feelings, emotions, and even pain from simply viewing a film. We do this using cells in the brain called mirror neurons. This collection of stories is meant to activate, ignite, spark, and dazzle you into inspiration. feels like, what's going on, right? I'm here, but no one's responding. I was just on a plane, I was just got out of the water, and I'm dead now. It felt like I was reading a book where I already knew the ending. <laughs> but, but this is a little bit more exciting. There's a lot more variables, I guess, happening. Even though I was constricted with all these things around me, I was just myself. Pulling yourself out of desperate situations like that take a lot of support and they take time and overnight transformations can't just happen. I think it's important for women to have a choice because I think it's their right. Their right, it's a civil right, it's a human right. Their mission is simple, but not easy. For the next 25 days, these two best friends... God, he's like a glowworm. <laughs> all right, we all know Levi's a little pal. ...and their trusty cameraman. I'm Aaron, and I will be your cameraman. ...will travel across America in search of inspirational stories of seemingly ordinary people chasing their dreams. Life is for the living, not for the dead. Live, enjoy, help people. Try to get everybody to get a good education and to forget about wars and guns. We are filming a cross-country documentary. On the way, we're doing things like this, making people smile. I needed that today, too. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Give, one Thank your, you. give one to your daughter, pass it on to a friend. Thank you. Why is it important to be who you are? Because if you can't accept yourself for who you are, nobody else can. All the while fulfilling one of their own dreams of making said documentary film. So, when you were little, what did you want to be when you were growing up? I wanted, I actually wanted to be a, a director. How about you? What I'm doing right, what I'm doing right now. Well, you got your dreams, dude. We, we still got... Dear me, it seems I've forgotten to introduce myself. You see, these gents can get a little wacky from time to time. So think of me as your tour guide. Let's get started. The Grand Canyon. A marvel to stare at, really. It, it's quite... Beautiful. It's so big. I just, I mean, every new spot that you get is just a totally different viewpoint. It makes you appreciate it that much more. It's, there's something intimidating about it and slightly unnatural because it's, but it is so natural. Does that make any yeah. sense? Do you know yeah. what I mean? It seems like one of these gents has a fear of heights. Developed. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, it's changed spots. <laughs> You fucking asshole. You fucker. Oh my god, I just shit myself. I don't care. Documentary. Schmockumentary. I don't want to climb it. I'm going to pass out. We're not climbing. Come on. We're not climbing the Grand Canyon. Fine. This is a terrible idea. This is an absolutely terrible idea. 
This is the day 250 people are rescued per year. <laughs> We're weak. Hey, this is insane. <gasps> oh, I'm the crochet. <sighs> this is stupid. I am petrified of heights. Like, this is like... I think you're a little too close to the edge. Come back. Just come on. Levi, get back in frame. Woo! <laughs> Wait a minute, stop. Uh, pause the film right here. You might be wondering who that lad is over there. Don't worry, you'll find out. Oh goodness, I've gotten a bit ahead of myself. Only about 4,000 miles. Uh, uh, where's that stubborn backwards button? That's not it. Oh, damn. There we go. Welcome to the desert. Why don't you call it by its name? Death Valley. I, we, I, you don't know if it's Death Valley. So you pull it up on a... This isn't right. I am so mad at you right now, Aaron. I want to break your jaw. The reason is, is because you are defeating yourself. I feel like I can relate to this. You feel? I feel terribly confused. Hold on, I'll get it right. Forgive me, it appears I've dropped you off at a swamp. For three people to travel across the country, through 22 states, 15 major cities, in a Mazda 3, with a fairly good amount of equipment. Hell yeah. It would seem I had the wrong button. <laughs> Technology. Naturally, we must pack for this adventure, which can be quite challenging under these circumstances. The thing is we have to, we have to live like this for 25 days. We have to seriously consider like what is important and what's not. Uh, we spent countless hours researching the trip, planning out these interviews, and really the whole thing ended up being very spontaneous and organic. It really didn't fall into play how we originally thought it would. What did you first think of this when John first told you? I actually thought he was crazy. <laughs> well, there's actually a misunderstanding about that. My, my very first comment to him was uh, something along the lines of, oh, it's going to be a party and you guys are just going to go across. And I found out later that he was kind of upset about that. You brought a shoe shining kit. A shoe shining fucking kit on a cross country documentary in a Mazda 3 with three people. His undefense, he did have a slightly little smaller duffel bag. Once I understood really what it was about and how serious and committed he was to it, it's actually quite, quite astonishing and really quite cool. I think. This is Aaron's nice twin that he's gonna love for all month. Does it come with him? It does. Oh, John tried to call dibs on him, but I said no. I get a giving, buddy. If you're giving Aaron the bed, you gotta give him the man. Well, I told Aaron just to be a little careful. Look, at, look out. You're gonna be in new places, and just watch out and make sure you don't get any uh, weird uh, circumstances. This time we really are getting on the road. Well, not Bye. me, because you really can't see me. In fact, I'm not fully certain of my creator. He's very cramped. But let's leave that for another film. All right, and oh, the parking brake's on. And <laughs> we literally worked around the clock, and it took us 40 days. We planned everything, funded it, and left on the trip. It was a nightmare. I think that you're going to have really unique and amazing experiences far beyond what you actually think you're going to have. I have my doubts as to whether these gents can even make it to the West Coast. We've made it two miles. Uh, not even two miles. Because Aaron doesn't have a lot of space back here. So we had to give him a little more. The day was kind to me. Um, we ran out of washer fluid. Only two hours into the trip. Yes, uh, because we hit so much snow. We're going to open this and Levi's going to dump some water on it. How do you Let's stop here for a second. Bear with me, I'm, I'm fairly new to these computer devices. Oh, damn. There we go, got it. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes. Sometimes you find inspiration, and other times it crashes into you.
I was the last passenger off the plane that crashed in the Hudson River known as U.S. Airways Flight 1549. I was in C-15A, wasn't supposed to be on the plane, but this happened to get put on that plane by cause of a business meeting ending early that day. It was a normal takeoff, but about 60 seconds after we took off is when I heard the explosion. When I looked out the window, I saw fire coming out from underneath the left wing, so I knew something had happened, but uh, I fly so often that I thought the plane lost an engine. The concern set in for me was when, uh, when we crossed over the bridge and Captain Sullenberger said his famous words, brace for impact. You know, first thing I did is I prayed and I put my wallet in my pants because I wanted to make sure that uh, if something did happen like that, then at least they could claim my body. I wanted my, my kids to know who I was and I wanted my body in one piece. My whole life passed before my eyes. It's like your movie of your life. When you think you're gonna die and you see you're that close, you think you're that close, it was things such as Little League Baseball, and I saw my mom as a kid, and old girlfriends, and playing football, and my, 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 my kids were being born. And that 60 seconds, your whole life passes. It's an unbelievable feeling when that moment comes, that one moment comes. It was a hard hit. He estimates he hit between 100 and 120 miles an hour, so it was an extremely hard hit. The seats broke. I went back and up in my seat immediately. It was that hard of a hit. But when I came back up, I saw, I looked up, I saw a light coming through that window. So, you know, I, and I was alive, so I knew I had a shot to get out. But immediately water started coming in the plane because the bottom of the plane was ripped off when it landed. I didn't have any emotion except get out. My focus was what's the easiest pathway for me to get out? Because I didn't pay attention to instruction. I didn't read the brochure. I didn't know where the exits were. You know, I, I was a typical traveler then, like you probably are now. We had some people that were trying to get up the aisle. So I waited to help get everybody out from the back of the plane. Well, I got to the door, but there was no room on the wing for me, and there was no room on the boat. So when people say, where were you on the wing? I never got on the wing. I looked out the wing, and I saw a lady. She was holding a baby, and you know she wasn't moving. So a couple of things went through my mind. But one of them was, man, if she doesn't move, I can't get out of here. Everybody stopped behind her, because I think everybody was either emotional to try to get out. They didn't know how to get out around her, and they didn't want to touch her, right? People were moving in front of her. That was, no, that was no big deal. It was behind her, and I was, in, I was hanging out the door of the plane. So you're stuck. Yeah. So I yelled at her, and I got her attention, and she looked at me, but uh, you know, what happened was there's another lady who was on the lifeboat who got the baby. She gave her the baby and got on the wing, and all of a sudden the people started walking down the wing. She was in a trance, you know, and someone had to break that trance, and I had some training on how to do that. So I knew if I shocked her some way, I could get her attention, that's what I did, I shocked her. I yelled, throw the baby. And she like looked at me. You know, I was like, but that's, as soon as she looked at me, she broke her state of mind of paralyzation or stifleness or whatever you want to call it. So she looked at me and then all of a sudden, that's when the other lady said, give me the baby. Everybody goes through trance times where you're just stuck. It's that moment someone jolts you out of that is when you make, make that next step. I thought that I was dead because, you know, I mean, I was ice cold. I could barely breathe. You know, I was naked. One of the officials there, probably authority, tagged my foot with my name and my date of birth on it. And when I grew up, there was a show MASH where they tagged your toe, you're dead. So the only reference I have for something on my foot was death. A company asked me to fly to Michigan that next Tuesday for a business meeting. I was just like back to being normal Dave on the job and just, you know, being the normal guy and no one was taking care of me. And this is four days after a plane crash. That was the toughest flight by far I've ever had in my life, by far. Tougher than even going down the Hudson River. And, but I tell people it was my choice to do it. I probably could have said no and had a very good right to say no. And no one probably would have fired me, but in business they judge you. And at that point, I was, didn't want to be judged like he's a, he's a coward. He's, he can't, he's weak. So I said, all right, I'll go. And it was the worst decision I ever made. I don't sweat the small stuff. I have a lot more gratitude. And I work my schedule around my family than work my schedule around the business. And that was the biggest change I made. Because one thing I realized is I was scheduling everything for business and I was missing, I, my eldest daughter, I didn't even see her in high school because I was busy. So no wonder she had anger in me and she didn't probably like me and she, she and I were always locking, locking horns. 
But this situation changed not only her perspective of me, but my perspective of what I had to do. So when things do get tough, and things get tough for everybody, I don't care who you are, somebody's gonna go through something in their life that's going to challenge them. Fortunately for me, I've had something that's challenged me, and now I have something to reference back. If I can survive this, I can survive all the things that have gone around it, I can pretty much handle anything. Five years, it took me five years, but I resigned from my company today. So I can impact more people, which is one of my driving forces in life, is how can I impact somebody even more every day? I gotta live my life for me. I can't live it for a big company. They don't care about me. I'm a number. I have figured that out, I knew it. But it took me a few years to figure out the strategy, and there's strategies on how to do things. Everything in life is strategy. But once I figured out that strategy, I'm executing the strategy and I'm executing it today. You never give up. And that's one thing I keep telling my kids that gets infuriates me when I see someone give up because you're this close, you're two centimeters away from that breakthrough and people stop. Whatever you are, you are, live it. Because when that moment of truth comes, and it'll come, everybody has a moment of truth. I don't care who you are in life. You have that one moment, that one second. Check your ear at the door, be who you are, and you'll ultimately, it will work out. Oh, come on. No. I have to make my will. All right, this is Aaron. Day one of Levi and John's adventure to kill me. But for now, they head toward Cleveland, Ohio. Not before a quick stop at John's first college, Slippery Rock University. And no, I'm not making that name up. Never, ever came to visit me at my school. And he's been crying and bitching and moaning for the last six years. I had been going to Slippery Rock University. Things had been going great. I had been dating a girl for two years. I finally felt like I was a part of society, blending in, um, and then just something still didn't feel right. So that's when I decided to move to Philadelphia. And then we used to slide down these. <laughs> I always knew that I was kind of a little different. Um, but it wasn't until this like one moment in time that I knew that I had been living this sort of lie my entire life. I have to pee like no other. Let your name in the snow. One night I came home and he was just really odd and I could tell something was up with him. <laughs> Come on, I know a place we can pee. I realized that one person wouldn't abandon me, that I would have somebody um, that it just, I don't wanna skip this one, skip this, come back to it. I gotta skip this one. <laughs> Got it. I remember how anticlimactic it was you telling me when you were gay. Like you were so upset. You never and you were so me. worried about it. And then you were like, I was just like, that's cool, like I don't care. And you were like, really? Like nothing? I was like, yeah. Crushing it. Uh, oh my forward. god, I hit my leg so hard. You're like, oh and well, I can just go tell everyone. And I did, didn't I? <laughs> you did. I told people. That was like my fun, the next month, that was the most fun I had. I'd be like, yeah, John's gay now. <laughs> Can't ever say I didn't fucking visit you at Slippery Rock now. We're here. <laughs> we just arrived in Cleveland. It took about nine hours. Nine hours. And we're standing in public square. It is very, very cold. Why do you think it's important for other people to be here today? Because be yourself. Be yourself, that's all. Love everybody and be yourself. I, don't, I think it's just a way of protection or to, to see who I'm better than you. I don't know. I really don't know why. But I think it's also in the home, too. You know, how they're, how you talk around the kitchen table. Yeah, you'd be lying to yourself, and you don't want to be a fucking liar. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> that's the most honest answer. That's I'm the most honest answer. answer. Now, this is um, my old friend from college. He hasn't name. seen him since he's been gay. I haven't seen him in two years. This is gonna be a long trip. <laughs> but it, it's like, it's a long trip, but like it goes, it, it's going by so far. Like I feel like I've done so much, but yet. And this is only day one. This footage like doesn't, 
Like, the only way this footage goes on, like, we only edit it to make us look more <laughs> respectable. Oh, jeez. I actually haven't talked to John about it, either. I have a fear that something bad will happen on this trip. <laughs> no, no, him, girl. Let me help you out, sister. I don't know if it's excitement as much as it is, like, I, I, I look at it as an opportunity to, to grow as a person. I, I, I'm, I very much, like, I like getting from A to B, and I, I rush from, like, all the in-between stuff. And I think that this, this project will hopefully help me not do that. Like, enjoy everything in between. And that's what I'm working on. Can I be found in a kitchen? No. no. <laughs> I don't mean that. Am I, a, am I edible? Nope. Wait, turn your head. <laughs> <laughs> you still have the largest breast. <laughs> well, I feel snug as a bug in here. This is just so snug as it is. Mm -hmm. I could not be in the car any longer. So we saw on the map that Indianapolis was close by and that they had these canals. Welcome to Indianapolis. The city of the canal. And that's it. That's it. There's just one canal and that's, and ducks and a lot of clean air. And it was anticlimactic. Okay, we're well, going to St. Louis. we're going to St. Louis we'll see now. You later. We'll see you there. One of my most favorite things to do is put John in uncomfortable situations. And when we went to the arch, his reaction was priceless. <laughs> There's the arch being constructed. I don't want to see that. Yes, you do. We're leave the arch. Going up the arch in St. Louis, I wanted to vomit the entire time. They stuff you in these 1950s retro space pods, and they shoot you up this clunkety arch that was built too long ago. Oh, no. The woman next to me is like in a ball. She's like, she's terrified, and I'm terrified. And the people in the pod next to us are screaming and shaking their pod, and everyone's pod's shaking. <laughs> get me off, get me off. It was terrible. It was a terrible experience. I never want to go back up the pod again. So we get to the top of the arch and you have to kind of lean over the balcony to look out the windows. And John was having a panic attack. He already freaked out in the elevator. So we had to get him back down. Why is it faster? Why is it? Well, the boys work on getting John down from the arch. Let's view another story, shall we? This one is about an entrepreneur living at Homes for Hackers, a community where individuals can live rent free while starting their own business. I lost my job and had to fire, I guess, 70 employees. Uh, let them go. Uh, reduction in force. And so, along with yourself. Along with, I was pretty much the last one to go. <laughs> I finished um, my MBA <laughs> and then I started looking for jobs. And so, and I couldn't even get interviews. So, it was really, really difficult just to find. I was perfectly qualified. It, it felt like the the work that I did didn't achieve the outcomes that I had expected. And I, I took a lot of personal responsibility there. Um, was it me that was, was it me that was the problem? Or was it the circumstances? There weren't, there were no jobs to be had at that point. When you go from having very clear direction to no direction, that's a very sudden shift. I had a good friend of mine, he was, uh, he had gone to live in Thailand and uh, he, he said, come on over. And, <laughs> and so I did, <laughs> and I didn't come home. <laughs> and then I got hired by a, a technology firm there and I was their managing director for about two years. You know, every day I'd wake up, well, should I go back or should I stay? And, you know, back in America, I didn't have a home, I didn't have a job, but my visa was coming up for renewal. It's time to take this experience and, and go back home. I have known for uh, a long time that 
that I wanted to start and run my own business. And in there's been a lot of life circumstances that have have um, steered me away from that, but I've stayed focused and I've never I've never given up on that dream. You know that's what really what Homes for Hackers is all about is giving people a little bit of space that they need where they can focus on their concept and not not so much worried about paying the rent. The more important factor I think is the Kansas City Startup Village that that this fiber has attracted a really great community and it's created this little ecosystem of entrepreneurs where we're all kind of helping each other. I have the benefit of focusing on my own project but I have the support of, of, of a community and that, that really, really helps. Are you heading in a particular direction? That, that's going to be fruitful or are you going down another rabbit trail? My fiance is in Thailand. Coming back here really has put a strain on that relationship. You're asking people to have faith in you before, before there's any tangible evidence. Nothing stifle, stifles creativity and inspiration. Than, than sitting in a, in a cube and someone telling you to create at this time and at this space. I don't know how it's gonna work out, but I, I do have confidence in, in, that it will. The greatest stress that I've experienced in my life um, has always been trying to please other people at my own expense. You know, I have to be true to myself and and and, and I need to be in relationships that are supportive of my dream. The advice that people tend to give you are, are, is self-serving advice. They're giving you advice that makes them comfortable. When you're pursuing things that you're passionate about, initially you get resistance and that people will push against you. But if you stay true, if you stay focused, People will come around, especially the people that love you. You gotta stay on the course for a little while and give people time to, to change their mind. Don't expect instant change. When things don't work out well for me, all my friends and family say, well, see, I told you so. <laughs> but when things do work out, see, they say the same thing. <laughs> see, I told you so. <laughs> So in the end, I guess it doesn't really matter as long as you're, you're focused and, and pursuing your dreams and your goals because the people are going to say the same thing. See, I told you so. So we're done with St. Louis. We had a fabulous time. It was awesome. So now we're headed, we got a short drive today, only about five hours to Kansas City. So Kansas City, here we come. Woo! Now the guys are heading westward, just like Lewis and Clark, except in a car with heat, unlimited music, and even Wi-Fi, whatever that is. So actually really nothing like Lewis and Clark, except for the direction, which is west. And this bunny is loves everyone. It's, it's a LGBTQLMSOPLG of the bunny. What does that last part mean? I don't know. They add a letter each year. I can't keep track. <laughs> <laughs> happy bunnies in the happy chest in the happy car with the happy people, and I'm gonna drive 14 hours to Denver. The drive to Denver was beautiful and purgatory. Kansas, beautiful state, flatlands, and then you know what it's like to cross the desert for 40 days watching windmills and flatland. It's endless, it literally didn't stop. The people in Denver were really awesome. They really energized the group back up. They gave us a little charge. The people from Denver gave us a little charge, a little, a little voltage. How are you going to embrace yourself in the new year? Oh, 
and be true to yourself. Yeah. You know, I just, I'm raising my kids to be good people. I am going to be happy. Be who you are. Be who you are. Hell yeah, I'll be who I am. I'm alive for one. Every day above ground's a good day. We're, we're still going west. We're going all the way over and then hit the southern all the way back. Southern way back. Maybe we should get a few drinks in us. <laughs> yeah, this is a little more approachable. <laughs> yeah. Wait, so what is it? What is happening tomorrow exactly? Somebody tell me. Pot yeah, becomes legal. So legal in the sense of what? 24? 21 and over, you can Oh, so you like going into a bar. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to live life and love it. Why? Because I only get one to live. Always stay positive. Promote positive energy at all times. Yeah! There we go. I want to quit smoking. Yep, that's there a good go. one. That one man told me, he said, he said, find, find the cannabis. Um, I think everyone in Colorado is, is high. Yeah. I'll dig deeper into my heart and be more sincere in my practice. I like Denver so far. The board's almost full. Yeah, people are starting to brace it out. It's not nearly full yet. Yeah. <laughs> born and raised in Philly. Nice. Oh, another we're, one. Both girls are born there. Awesome. We're, we're Temple alums. Be who you are in sign language. <laughs> That's all <awesome. laughs> yeah. oh, Denver has re-energized me and I haven't even had any pot yet. <laughs> That's a lie. And it'll be legal. <laughs> We were completely exhausted by this point, but we were in Denver, Colorado. They were legalizing pot at midnight, and this was New Year's. So damn it, we were gonna celebrate. Yes, yes, come on! Oh, Woo! Happy New Year, Philadelphia! This bottle Happy is over, Cartman. This one's not good. They still have an hour, guys. Oh. I'm done right, filming for the day, Aaron. Right. I'm enjoying New Year. <laughs> We're gonna get uh, a little bit drunker, a little bit thicker, because of the altitude difference. Where's Levi? <laughs> Sorry. And Carrie, thank you for letting us stay at your house. I knew we're a crew. All right, Levi, this needs to be done. Come on, get it back. And so we went out on the streets, and we had a good time. That's all I remember. Is that all of it? At first we thought it was going to be easy to get people engaged and active online and out in person, but it was more difficult than what we thought. The traveling and the constant living out of the bag is starting to wear on us. It's like all the things we said we were going to do, it's like we can't do them. Why is that? Because it's just not... I just don't feel... Well, I think we're, I'm so tired. I think we're in a weird place because... Everything we wanted to do, we couldn't, which a lot of people said, but I think we've done more than most people would have thought to do. We kept updating um, all of our social media, our website, everything, um, but it just became entirely too much, and it all kind of came to a head, in, I think, in Denver. Uh, we just couldn't do it anymore. There wasn't enough manpower. Because most people, at this point, they probably would have been like, fuck it, I'm just going to film and have fun and just have a good road trip. But essentially, like, like, and that's not what we're doing. Like, this definitely isn't what people what people originally thought it was. This is the butter you use. No, there's just stick. We didn't use butter. We used cream cheese. Problem is with this, we have to take we have to take a decision and just run with it. It would seem like some trouble is brewing. Let me explain this a little better. The gents need to get to Vegas, but can't because of a storm in the mountains. But really, I didn't think they'd get through the mountains anyway. Let's be real. It's January at nearly 14,000 feet. Damn it, Levi. The problem is we're losing time and we're going back. We have to double back. I kind of think it's important to get to the, the coast. Yeah. Because that think. was part of the whole reason we chose this route was to get all the way to the, to the west coast. I mean, are you filming or, or, or are you on your tablet? I'm just, ask, I'm just asking. At such a very crucial turning point in the documentary, we had no clue what was going to happen. And I was insulted that he could not see that this was important for him to capture this moment. I mean, I, I lost it. What? Man, it's just, it's just like, I, like, I don't, obviously we're having an issue right now. We don't even have, we don't even have an address yet to go to Albuquerque. We're going to have to find a hotel and start getting that way. We're here. 
<laughs> Can you get our bags? <laughs> <laughs> so, should I park the car? Should I leave it right here? You know, I don't think there's a whole lot of traffic coming in at 2.30 in the morning. I think you'd be okay to park the car here. I don't remember just taking this long last time, do you? We've been trying to back up our hard drive for some time. And we've only had disaster. Oh, 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 oh. The finder can't complete the operation because some data in the UR can't be read or written. That is actually not good. So basically everything that we, we imported from Denver, we don't have because we never backed that up before we left. That is correct. This is so confusing. That's the problem. Because like there's so much that it's like it's very confusing. It's just nerve wracking whether or not to know it's there. In that room. John Flex for us. Let's some views. It's like so addictive. <laughs> <laughs> now, my friends, is how you play racquetball in a hotel room. <laughs> We woke up the next morning, everyone was having a pleasant time, I was doing some hotel room aerobics. You guys, we gotta do jumping jacks now. But don't get these, because I'm up there, gonna bounce by. And then, boom, shit hits the fan. And on this trip, that's what you're doing. You know the need for you here. The reason Aaron Stevens is currently in fucking Albuquerque, New Mexico, is because he's an extension of that camera. So this is a complex issue. Aaron doesn't have any cinema experience, but he had broadcast and journalism experience, which we thought would be best used on this trip. Maybe I'm just not cut out for it, honestly. Maybe I'm just not cut out for this at all. You are defeating yourself. Like, you're not cut out for it? Aaron, anyone's cut out for it. It's just whether they're willing to do the work or not. And you know what's happening? What my struggle is and what his struggle is, is our credibility falls down to you. We have to trust you to capture those moments. Otherwise, we don't have a film. Once we got to Albuquerque, we had so much stress and we feel like we didn't really capture uh, as much as we wanted to capture. I want you to be like, fuck you, I'll be good enough. I'm gonna know that camera so goddamn well that you guys couldn't do this production without me. We would be happy. I think though that we're talking in circles. Yeah. And really it comes down to this. It comes down to, you know, what do you, what do you, what do you want? What, what, what is, you I said you're passionate. fucking camera. I want to learn how to do this, and I want to make this documentary, and I want to make a goddamn good one, and I'm going to do it. Then you have to Las Vegas. If by Las Vegas you haven't started to figure it out and make some traction, we're sending you home. While the guys cool off, let's meet Mark. Everything kind of started with Star Wars, like fighting with lightsabers, that's like what I did from like when I was six. I didn't know it was martial arts, like it's based off of like European sword fighting and like kendo. I had no idea what that stuff was, I was just like, I have a lightsaber, I'm gonna swing it around and like beat the crap out of trees. During high school, like never really had a niche, I had a group of friends, but was never really good at anything or like particular to one thing. And then after I graduated, we found this thing called parkour and it led us to a camp in California. We all went out to this camp and trained for like a week and got exposed to martial arts, uh, specifically Wushu, which is Chinese martial arts. It's like Jet Li, Jackie Chan type stuff. And uh, loved it so much that wanted to pursue it like full time, like as a dream job. I was talking with my gymnastics coach and you know, we were just talking about like what I was doing, like why I was doing gymnastics at the time and stuff. And she's like, dude, you should go do something. Like you're gonna get married here, you're gonna go to school here, you're gonna have kids here, you're gonna die here, like. And then I saw this Facebook status, this guy named DY, he was like, hey, I'm looking for a roommate, does anybody wanna do it? And I looked at it and this is my chance. I have an in to like move somewhere, like I won't be homeless, and I just went for it, so. Shit, I just committed to moving to California and I hadn't told anybody about it. I didn't ask for advice. I dropped out of school, quit my job, broke up with my girlfriend, said goodbye to everybody and just kind of head out. My biggest obstacle would be my dad because what he thinks is like really important to me. I was like, he's never gonna let me drop out of school. 
So I told him I got a gig in The Expendables 2, which was a movie that was in production at the time. And I had no connection to that whatsoever. It's just like, yeah, I'll be gone three months. Um, I'll need to pack everything I own because I'm gonna be living out there. I don't really didn't think it through all the way, but on all my family's like, oh, you're gonna be in another movie. That's awesome. They're all like really happy for me. And like, it sucked because it was a lie and I was like hiding behind this lie to get to where I want to go. Were you ever scared? Yeah, all the time. What did it feel like? Um, like falling out of a plane. Me and my dad argued with me. He was like, no, you, you shouldn't do this. Like, you're gonna be gone too long. You have to finish school. And we had argued like for six hours straight one day. We were just arguing, arguing, arguing. And at the end of it, we kind of like settled down. And then he was like, Okay, so when are we leaving? I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, I'm not gonna let you drive across the United States by yourself, you're gonna kill yourself. So he actually ended up driving with me, I was under the impression that in three months he'd be flying back out to drive me back home. He never had a chance to like do what he wanted. So he, not that he was trying to like suppress that for me, but he was like, hey, you're not doing anything. You need to, he just wants me to do something. And then when I went home, I was like, I gotta tell you something like, there's been no movie like, some things have been true, a lot of things haven't been true, and like, I'm sorry that I've been lying to you, but, but you know, it's something I gotta do. And he was just like, I don't care that you wanna do what you wanna do. He's like, I think that's awesome. It's hard to change who you are because you just wanna be a certain way. Like even when I go visit, I'm back to my old mark. And then when I'm out here, I feel like I'm kinda different. When you're free of obligation, you just kinda like, can do whatever you want. You think that's selfish? Yeah, but you kind of have to have personal loyalty. Like you have to be loyal to yourself or you'll kind of be stuck. You have these outside sources that are like, you need to do this if you want to get better. And I was like, yeah, maybe I should get better at that. I should do that. And then all these people started telling me th these things like at Starbucks at work, they were like pushing me towards like promotions and then training. They're like, oh, we're going to perform more and compete more. And I'm like, monotonous like oh I'm just doing the same thing every day like doesn't matter what I'm doing it's just movement and I like snapped out of it I was like oh shit I'm out here like I ditched everybody back home like I should be doing something and now I'm doing it so like all of a sudden I just like got into the moment and like my expression came out on film for the first time like better than I thought it was going to be and there's just this feeling there that even though I was constricted with all these things around me I was just myself and then that moment, I finally was like, okay, now I see my goal and this is what I want to do. So don't let anybody else tell you what you want to do. I think growing up, you have, te you know, you start, teachers tell you what to do, and then your parents tell you what to do, and then your friends tell you what to do. And everybody wants to give you your advice. I think if you have something you want to do, you have to try it. You know, if you try it and you give it your best and it doesn't work out, that's fine, you, you tried it, and okay, maybe it wasn't for you. You'll find something else. Dad's gotta go booby really bad. He's had the bubble guts for some time oh, on God. the highway. <laughs> Why is this happening? <laughs> I think I'm worried that right now we're at this weird point where I think our stress, we could go one way or the other, and that kind of scares me. We could all either be ripped apart or we could bond. So we're at that point where we either need to finish tearing each other apart and start the bonding process, or it might just fall into pieces. Did you not booby? Did it not come out? Welcome to... Indian City. It's not, it's not a lot of sitting. Yeah. Well, it's been really hard to engage with people because um, uh, we don't know the cities and they're not like Philadelphia, and they're not like St. Louis, where you can go on the street and find people. Uh, people seem to hide out here. I just don't think there's people. I think that's like, I mean, look behind me. That, that is like, <laughs> that is why, because there are just no people to engage with. The Sky City Casino Hotel. I wanted to come here so bad. And now that I'm here, it's not what I thought it would be. 8,000 miles to go, 8,000 miles to go. 
Let's not do Levi's one now, just to piss him off. <laughs> this looks grand. I'm actually glad we came during this sunset. I think it's actually better this. Oh, I feel nauseous. Oh, I don't know. John, come on. You oh can't not. Gosh. Come on, come on, John, come here. Oh. Hey, it's not so bad yet. We made it to the Grand Canyon. It's ginormous. Huge. Like, literally, you can't explain how large this thing is. Take a peek. See, I told you we'd be back here. Have you overcome any big obstacles in your life, would you say? Um. Besides climbing down here, where we're not probably <laughs> supposed to be. Let's see, I came out as trans three days ago, so. Three days Oh my god, high five! <laughs> That's, That's awesome. awesome! When did you, when did you figure that, that out? Oh, when I was 14. But you've been like hiding it this whole time? Uh, yeah, basically. But what made you do it, finally? Um, I don't know, kind of just sick of, uh, not being myself. It's taken time, that's why I kind of came on this road trip. It was like a get out and just like finalize the whole like feeling of just being free. Be free on the road, you know, be free in my life everywhere. No, I don't like this. I don't like this spot. <laughs> my mother's gonna shit herself. Oh, John, you got it. Alright. Come on, big girl. Stop! Wait. <laughs> The altitude is terrible. Do you lungs burn? Yes, they're but, bleeding. Why do you feel like they're dying? Do you think we had enough adventure for one day? No, we're going to Vegas. Hey, sweet land. Hey, sweet land. Baby Jesus, sweet land. He I'm so proud of you. Oh, my God. The van that doesn't like roller coasters just climbed to the tip of the Grand Canyon with me. I, I, I'm man. so happy. It was a lifetime experience. And anyone who has not come here yet, Strongly, strongly recommend it. Yeah, this, this is insane. You just, you can't take it in through a lens. Hello, and welcome to Vegas. Goodbye, we're leaving Vegas. Oh, how you feel about your time here in Vegas? Did Get me out. Did you... We had a lot of fun in Vegas, in one day. You can do a lot in one day if you really put your mind to it. Our camera guy spent all of his money in Vegas. At a restaurant. At a restaurant. How do you feel about the trip thus far? It's been great, but Vegas took a lot out of me, literally and metaphorically, monetarily, um, and personally. <laughs> Um, so what happens when you let a cameraman off his leash. Yeah. And dignity. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the dignity's... Bye. <laughs> if you can see that, our cameraman is in the back right there. He makes like a little nest, a little crevice. <laughs> where... That's where you see going. <laughs> now it's back in the car, headed for the coast. This is where John wants his vacation home to be. In Death Valley. He wants to be the only resident in Death Valley. They've adapted. Oh my gosh, stop, John, stop! <laughs> what, what, what? What, what is it? You. There's nothing, I just wanted him to freak out. Uh, why did you do that? I just threw my mouth. Oh. Does it burn? It burns. <laughs> well, there's John, and I'm Levi. Wait, and oh, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm literally hacking. Yeah, no, it's good. That's when you're pretty. That's rude. <clears> hey, <throat> okay, go Hello, and welcome to the desert. Why don't you call it by its name? Death Valley. I, we, I, you don't know if it's Death Valley. So you pulled up on a map, you stopped at a gas station, and it said Death Valley, and now you think it's You Death think Valley. somebody's going to argue with us. Turn around. You think somebody's really going to argue with us? Maybe, it's not Death factual. Valley? Why would you say it? And we've been driving for the past 45 minutes, and all the places look the same. So if you name it, fine. We'll do one that says, welcome to Death Fucking Valley, and then you can research it after you Google map it. And if, if it's Death Valley, then we'll use that one. Anybody's happy? You Read feel better? Did you express yourself? I express myself. Take four. Hello, and welcome to 
Death Valley. Very hot. The lads stopped at their hotel in San Diego before a drive up the coastal highway. They are, for some reason, unknown to me, set on touching a bit of the Pacific Ocean. Now, one time when I was a kid, my dad brought me back a rock from uh, a place such as this. So I'm going to bring him one back. We have made it all the way to the West Coast. It's about 3,000 miles. Like a turning point for yes. us. We've traveled so far, and we've made it. And now I'm going to touch the water. Yes. <laughs> you didn't even wear your seaweed dress. Wear the seaweed. You want to unsave your car? I think the cameraman wants to wear the seaweed. <laughs> Good job! Now let me try. Show them what Slippery Rock can do. I want it to, I want the ocean to flatten out though. Yay! Yeah, there it is. Two jumps. Alright. Two jumps in a sink. That's what we call them back at college. Is that what they call them? That's what we call you. Two jumps in a sink? Yeah, two jumps in a sink. I don't get that. Hey, use the bathroom. Really? Yeah. Oh, please. You're going to get in the car in five minutes and you're like, oh, guys, we need to stop. I got to go tink tink. That's the key to the city. <laughs> Where the hell leave I go? I'm gonna have to pee now. Shit, maybe I should have peed earlier. Where the hell is Levi? Um, I'm getting ice cream, that fucking fat ass. Nay, no, you're getting ice cream, you bitch, without me. That's not very nice. They are on their way to a place called Painted Rock, a petroglyph site. Look what Rita says. Rita says it's an unpaved road and she's slightly confused as to where we're at. So we just kept turning down road after road and it was nothing. I mean literally, absolutely nothing. Native people decorated these rocks thousands of years ago to tell a story and leave their mark. Unbeknownst to our adventurers, they are doing something similar with this film. Leaving behind a story in the ever-growing pile of digital rocks known as the World Wide Web. We made it all the way to Painted Rock. It says to follow the path, so we'll follow the path. Oh, and rattlesnakes. Rattlesnakes, yep, there were rattlesnakes there in Painted Rocks. Caution snakes. Yeah. I don't think we have a venom kit in our, uh, that happens to be a rattlesnake. Ah! Where? Where? No, the sign. <gasps> Jesus Christ. Dude. Levi, you need to stop doing that. I'm reading what it says. I'm not being a dick. No, but what I'm saying is, yeah, so yeah, other people have wrote on them, but they're not like the whole point of these is that like some person a long time ago, like 12,000 years ago, drew this on this rock. And that's and it meant something to them. And you don't think that's cool? It is cool. I don't know. This looks like a critter. This looks like some kind of like worm thing. This looks like another critter. This is like like maybe a man. Oh, where's Big Susie? She probably got bit by a rattlesnake. Let's go see if we can find her. Stay on the trail though now. You wouldn't want to get off track. Oh, let me unbutton my pants though because I cannot ride my pants button. After you, my lady. Ooh, well then. <laughs> well, well. All right, gentle ladies. Oh, they could have used more color on the rocks. Well, we'll send them an email when we get back. They don't think they get email. They made those a long time ago, Susie Q Bananas. You never know. Growing up, I had what most people would call an alternative family, for lack of a, a better term. Um, I had two dads and a mom. So basically when my mom was in college, she dated a guy named Paul um, and then halfway through college he came out to her. And it was a very different time, it was the 60s um, 
and she wanted to support and love him regardless. After they both graduated, they decided to get married anyway, even though Paul was gay and she knew that. Um, they had an open marriage, obviously, um, just because they knew they wanted to spend the rest of their lives together. And um, when my mom decided she wanted to have kids, Paul said, I'm totally supportive of that. Go ahead and have kids. I will be there. I'll be present. I just don't want to be the father. So she had another very close gay friend named David um, who desperately wanted a family. And being single and gay in Nebraska, that wasn't really an option. He couldn't just go adopt. Um, so she was married to Paul, had kids with David, um, and all three of them lived in the same house. Um, they had my sister, they had me, um, and things were great. Then when I was two, my biological dad, David, got mysteriously really, really sick and just died. Um, so they did an autopsy and they found he was HIV positive. Um, I was conceived at sort of the peak of the AIDS epidemic. It got kind of tricky growing up explaining to people who Paul was to me in my life because I call him my stepdad because there is no word for what he was to me. He's not really my stepdad. My mom didn't remarry. She was always married to him. I was only seven and I didn't really understand death and what that meant. And I didn't, I knew she had this terrible thing called AIDS, but I didn't really know what that meant. But as soon as I walked downstairs and I saw her laying there, and she didn't recognize me. She was delirious. She was just babbling nonsense. Um, she clearly was just gone. It feels like a kick in the stomach. To go from having three supportive, amazing parents to one. And it felt scary, especially because um, Paul originally said, you know, I don't want to be the father. My mom basically told Paul, please, please finish raising the girls. And so he gave her his word that he would, that he would do that. So while culturally and artistically our lives were very rich, things were also incredibly difficult. Um, he was making a living in Nebraska doing drag, makeup, working at a costume shop, and in theater. The house kept getting more and more decrepit um, as the years passed. Um, it got to the point where I didn't even want to invite friends over. It got so bad. Extreme depression can really make people just sort of let go of themselves and not worry about about wellness and well-being, and that really came through in our family. There was a lot of passing it off as if, I'm confident, it doesn't matter. I'm a strong feminist, this is okay. Like, I'm comfortable in my body, when really deep down I wasn't at all. I was embarrassed to exercise because it had been so intimidating and scary growing up that I just, I didn't want to be the fat kid out running or or even riding a bike because I was afraid that everyone would be staring at me. In uh, 2008, serious cuts to the Metro service occurred and my main route to school was cut. So out of complete desperation, I bought a bicycle off of Craigslist. I would take my giant, huge Schwinn cruiser on the Metrolink with me on the train, and then I would ride the rest of the way to work. This isn't so torturous anymore. Like This is actually starting to feel really good. And so I would get off the train one stop earlier as time went on, and it got to the point where I just ended up riding everywhere. It's given me self-reliance that I've 
never really had before. Because growing up, I relied so much on other people to give me rides from point A to point B. And so when I started Googling biking and traffic, bike commuting, St. Louis, I found TrailNet. And they offered classes called Bike Smart classes. And I signed up and I took one. And I learned basic maneuvering skills that completely changed my confidence on the road. I knew I really, really wanted to work here because um, it was really important to me and um, TrailNet's programming and, um, and classes had really changed me and I, I wanted to be able to do that and inspire other people to also find what I've found for myself. The class that I attended before I worked at TrailNet, the Bike Smart class, I teach those now. And it's been so incredible to watch people have that light bulb go off in their minds. I'm not anti-car by any means, but there are so many more options available that I think people don't realize. Even just little trips, even if it's just once a week to the grocery store and back by bike, all makes a difference. Overnight transformations can't just happen. And so I think that sensitivity to people's situations, I think is something that I've developed because I've been there and I know what it feels like um, to know that you're not making healthy decisions, but being so far gone that you don't even care. There's still the rest of my life ahead of me and and that there's always time for more more growth and more change <laughs> onward to houston texas the state of the lone star so i've read and so i am supposed to believe can you sound a little more excited i'm yeah. just kidding yeah yeah sure, sure. hey y'all Welcome to Houston, Texas. Lone Star State, baby. <laughs> no one wants to talk to us. Sad. Well, I mean, when you're out here, there's going to be people who say no to you. You can't take it to heart. I'm a happy person, so I'm always happy. Most of the time. Sometimes he pisses me off, so I'm unhappy. Uh, it's a blessing every day at my age to wake up. Yeah. You better believe it. And I'm a veteran. Well, thank you, sir, for serving. Appreciate it. We appreciate you. We're haggard, man. We've been on the road for 15 days, all, really? all by car. Car? All yeah. by car. Yeah. Well, if I pretend I'm somebody else, I have to remember who I pretended I was. <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> yeah. hey, why do you think it's important to think young and hard? Because I ain't gonna never grow old. <laughs> but you can fool everybody else, but you can't fool yourself. Boring if everyone's the same, so you want everyone to be unique and be their own personality. Well, I'm from Boston. Oh, a high five. High five. Think about it. Don't react. Just think about it. Follow yourself. Follow yourself. That. That's fun. It's kind of hard to do if you, but I get it. Yeah. That's cute. I like that. Follow what you want. What your heart tells you. We are leaving Houston, Texas. Woo. On our way to Louisiana, New Orleans. And uh, we don't have too long of a drive today, so uh, I won't be um, grumpy and Levi won't be mean. We stopped to get ourselves something to eat at Whataburger. Whataburger. No, it's Whataburger. Whataburger. Yeah. Whataburger. Whataburger. It's the last Whataburger before we get out of Texas. So we stopped, we had it. There's a suggestion on Facebook. Thank you, whoever did it. And then we saw this place and had to stop, and it's feeling groovy. <laughs> they said, man, I could come in here and throw down on a bean bag and just be in here for hours. Something about it is the serenity and the relaxation of that room. Should we take the camera back there so you can catch yeah, it? Yeah, see if we can get a little bit. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know what the camera's doing. Down the rabbit hole. <laughs> it's got every kind of color that you can think of, and it's just pulling you straight into it. Now, this is what they call a Nosferatu. That's a 1930 silent movie Dracula. Continuing their trek through the southern states, I see we've arrived at New Orleans, specifically Bourbon Street. Oh, that reminds me. Ah. We're in New Orleans on 
Bourbon Street. <laughs> Bourbon Street. <laughs> she getting frisky with you. Did she steal anything? She stole your wallet. She Next thing, I got my money. New Orleans right now. I'm not talking about Mike. <laughs> You're doing a bad job. Smile. One smile may change, it might not be able to change the world, but you may change someone's world. So, you know, keep smiling. It's sometimes it's contagious and, you know, you might save somebody's day, maybe their life. You know, first of all, if you come to a place like New Orleans, you have to be really open. You know, if you're not open, <laughs> <laughs> man, you're going to have a really bad time. Do you want to dance? Aaron. New Orleans has some characters and not a lot of class. <laughs> <laughs> sing your song, sing your what's, song. What's my song? My no-no, the no-no is it. <laughs> oh, oh, so my aunt, my aunt told me this one. It's for all the little girls. They'd be like, she'd be like, stop! Don't touch me there! These are my no-no squares. <laughs> I really love makeup and and eyelashes and just like being girly and that's one thing that I really wanted to embrace in the new year was the fact that it's okay to be that because I think that so many times like we're told like you want to be your natural self you know and be who you are yeah. but sometimes it's a part of who you are and so that's one thing that I wanted to encourage myself to do is just to be that person who's you know wants to get dressed up and wants to put on the makeup even if people don't understand. I may have planned the swamp trip without exactly telling John where we were going. This day isn't going very well for some of us. Experience native swamp animals. A lot of bad poisonous snakes, water moccasins, cottonmouths, copperheads. It's not, you saw the brochure. Th right. No, that's the part that scares me. Wild hogs, coyotes, bobcats. Really and seriously better not be what I think it is. Nutras, otters, coons, possums, rabbits, armadillos. You said it was like a thing, like a, like a... What is a thing? Like a thing. John really does not like roads at all. And we's a rocker. Well, if we get there and we don't like it, we can just leave. Oh, uh, well, we get it. Yeah, we're next time you're gonna be down in the bayou, New Orleans. Never, I'm not. I don't, I don't want to be in the bayou. <laughs> what if you know me? What if you know me, bud? I've watched that show Swamp People on the History Channel. Okay, here we go. You told me it wasn't like that. It's not. You told me it was classy. It is. It's very classy. Why does the highway just end? Oh, this is tragic foreshadowing. This is how people lose kidneys. They do have bull sharks in there, too. Yeah. Okay. Three, four foot <laughs> bull shark, yeah. Water skiing, jet skiing, swimming, you name it, they do it. They swim here, yeah? Sure, they swim here. Why? <laughs> <sighs> oh my God, my heart is racing. How big do they get out here? Oh, goodness, we got some 14, 15 footers out there. I'm gonna go right around a little bit. See what else we can find out there. At one time, they estimated less than 300,000 gators in the whole state. That's not many. Now they estimate 3.3 .3 million. Oh. So there are thousands of gators out here. Every year, it's two or 3,000 they drop out here. Yeah, which I say, y'all want a cool Bud Light? <laughs> Bud Light, watch out! Ah! <laughs> 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 little Bud Light. That little Bud Light, that's his name. <laughs> Actually, my daughter named her Allie. Has she ever bit you? Oh, sure. You can't tame them, they will bite you. you Got to be real careful with them. And gators do have the most powerful bite of any animal. Even little like this. Open up. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't want to kiss you. you she doesn't like it. Them? All right, Johnny boy. They know you. Yeah, Oh, she'll bite you if she wants to look at her face. Oh, man, it's it. yeah. See, we let the cameraman have fun a couple times every now and then. Hey, Gators. He loved it. He was giggling like a schoolgirl the whole time. I think he may still keep in contact with Cat and TikTok. Hey. Oh, oh. 
folks, you the lady sir, guys, I didn't know you was gonna go. We had an excellent time on our airboat with Captain TikTok. We were on there and the lady faced her fear. She um She held the gator. She held a gator. She was so scared to hold the gator, so she held the gator. And there's the hunter. Okay, okay, you know what? Okay. I don't think so. It. 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 Yeah. It just just let me and get now. used to that. <laughs> <laughs> Quick! Looking happy. Did it, I faced fear. On the land, all right? This way, yeah, yeah, See we gotta go this way. My name is Sarah Bryant. And what do you do, Sarah? I guess if you want to say the big thing I did, maybe was help get started with Planned Parenthood. Well, actually, I'd been doing work with the Quittenden Home. Quittenden Home is home for unwed mothers. And I'd been doing that for many years. And there was a, a man who was a banker here in Charlotte and another man who was head of the Department of Social Services who said, why don't you get Planned Parenthood started here? And I said, oh, what are you talking about? And they said, well, you need to work on that because you know so much about this thing. Happened to have a red telephone in my house. So I set up a telephone number for Planned Parenthood. And then two times people found them their way to my house when there was only a telephone number. And then there were three girls that came from Nashville, and one of them was pregnant. And she wanted to know if she could get an abortion. We didn't have anything in, in North Carolina that was, you know, helping people like that. So I went to New York, and I looked at Planned Parenthood, and I saw, well, nothing was in New York, in North Carolina. So I said, we look like the third world. So they said, if you raise $10,000, you can open a Planned Parenthood clinic in Charlotte. We opened the clinic in 72. We've been working for about two years to get it going. And, and that's when we had people come in to protest. And, you know, they would just really, really protest it but there were other people who supported us. A nun, a Catholic nun, set up our counseling, counseling services, and she was teaching counseling at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And she would send her students to do their internship at Planned Parenthood, and she would come there and help in her full habit at that time. Why is that a big deal? That was a big deal. That was what people could not understand all over the country. When I was on the national board and I would speak at some places like St. Louis or Detroit where there were a lot of Catholic people, you know, they would say, and a Catholic nun worked with you? And I said, yes, she did. She was a real close friend of mine. Oh, they would stand out on the street with their signs and try to tell people not to come in and that, you know, you're going to kill your baby. And there were just all kinds of things like that. But they didn't know that we really had people who counseled the young women. And they would be told that they had choices. I never, ever talked to a young woman who was, even if she had made a total decision, who had an easy time deciding to get an abortion. So I thought it was a good thing to do. I really thought it was a needed thing. And my husband supported me. Well, when you go to, with Sarah to one of these meetings, what do you do? And he said, oh, well, he, was, he had a wonderful sense of humor. He said, well, oh, you know, I go shopping with the girls. <laughs> They'd be sort of swap roles. It was the first in the state of North Carolina. And then now we are the West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, all together in one group right now. And that's We're, the group? Mm -hmm. You started it? I started it. It feels good. It also feels good to know that I had so many good friends who helped me. As I say, it 
takes more than just one person. I think it's important for women to have a choice because I think it's their right. Their right, it's a civil right, it's a human right. It's a human right. It ought to be your own choice. Nobody should make that choice for you. As a matter of fact, I had the privilege of finding that out. Doctor told me I should not have another baby. He said, well, if you are pregnant, of course, you know we can terminate it. You can have an abortion. Well, during that time that I was up there in the mountains and with those young women and thinking about what, I'm, what would I do if I'm pregnant? Will I, will I terminate it or would I keep it? And for me, I made the decision that if I were pregnant, I would not have an abortion. I would take the, tr the chance that I might, you know, maybe or maybe it may not make it. But it also cemented my belief that a woman had the right to make that choice, whichever way she wanted to go. It made it cemented my belief in the in the privilege of a woman to choose. Why did it cement? Because I have, I had the privilege of making the decision myself, and I and I for me, I thought for me I would not do it, but I had no right to tell another woman, or for anybody to tell another woman what she should do. I guess I think that whatever I had done must have been all right because I'm still having a good good life and I've been very fortunate to have a good life. It's something I had to do and I knew I did. And it's, it's worth it, I can tell you that. Some friends didn't support me. You know, there were other people who didn't. And I knew that, so I had to accept it and go on with whatever I believed. Say, go get it. Go do it. Go for it. I kept right on. I never thought it was too much. I thought it was the thing to do. I think what you're doing in making a documentary about these tough things that people go through, I am proud to know that I've been a part of that. Now our intrepid adventurers have decided in order to memorialize this odd odyssey, they will brand themselves with ink upon the skin. We're going to go to this tattoo parlor and see if we can get tattoos. We called them earlier. They said we're allowed to film mm. and that they have some openings tonight. I don't want to do it. Why not? I don't know. My parents hate tattoos. I hate needles. I pass out all the time. So. Um, yeah, and it's like permanent, and I have a really hard time with permanent things. But this trip was interesting and exciting and fun, so hopefully I'll always remember it that way. Well, that's how I look at tattoos. It's more, you know, the tattoo itself is important, but what it symbolizes is your time, your life at that point in time. My father's been telling me since I was a little kid, slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down, and everything, I, all the time. I don't slow down and enjoy the moment. I'm always hurrying from one space to the next. So slow down is very important for me. I remember my first day too. We got a little furniture. Now just for reference, if for some reason he chickens out, I will kill him. Guess he's done. <laughs> Score. Well, that's gonna be sore tomorrow. Ew. Fishy. 
It, you know what it reminds me of? Like when you get meat packed in like the grocery store, it has like that plastic, like that on it. <laughs> you want to touch it? Nah, I don't touch it. It's very tiny. What does it say? It says slow down. Why, um, why'd you get that? Because like when I go um, near school zones, I want to just like lift my arm up so people know to slow down. We're going to go eat because we're, we're starving. starving. And um, that's just a weird thing we do with our pinkies. When you repeat the same Say word the together. same word together. Like, jinx, you owe me a Coke. We just do. link pinkies. Finally, we're in the home stretch. Onward, gents. Onward. Here's something that's happy about we're checking into our last hotel. Nice. It's kind of depressing now. A little bit, a little bit. I feel happy <clears throat> that we all made it. It's like this trip was a giant scavenger hunt and we were crossing the entire country to find every little nugget we could. And now we have this bag of stuff and we just have to figure out, you know, what we can build out of it. Toward the end of it, I think we finally started to like find our roles and find our groove. Ooh, they're working on it. No, they're just cleaning it for you. I talked to them earlier. They better take that down by tomorrow. Every time you're pressed for a step or something happens and you feel like you've overcome something on this trip, you overcome something later. Welcome to our last city, Washington, D.C. If you don't enjoy the journey from A to B, and in this case, a to B to C to D to E to F to G. If you don't enjoy those small nuggets in between, then what's the point of doing it? There it is. It has taken us 23 days. Three days of blood, sweat, tears. At the end of the day, I'll appreciate this trip so much more in two months, in six months, in 12 years. It's weird thinking that it's gonna be almost done soon. It's uh, kind of like unsettling and happy at the same time. I don't think I would change anything. And I will say, because it could have it gone a lot worse. <laughs> I want to go talk to Lincoln now. Hell yeah. You know, we did it. And I'm very proud of that. Hey everyone, we're standing here in don't say hi, everyone. Okay. What is only one person watching a TV okay. show? Take two. Which is one of the reasons John and I work so well together. Because we're one of the few people our own age that will check each other and push each other and take each other to the edge. Typical Philadelphia uh, tradition, we're going to run up the steps, like at the art museum, Rocky. Even though we're in D.C. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad it's done. <laughs> But I'm sad it's done. Why are you sad? Because I'm not gonna see you guys anymore. We're, like, we're a team, you know? Like, we go everywhere together. There are more steps than I thought there were. Everyone thought that we were crazy, that we weren't gonna be able to like do this, and then we weren't actually gonna come through with it. Levi and I have always had a special bond, but I definitely feel a special bond with Aaron. Come on, cameraman. We were these individuals that came together for this moment in time, for this project that just worked. I ain't running up with this equipment, you kidding? <laughs> <coughs> I trip something falls, you kill me if I don't die. People like President Lincoln and our forefathers um, paved the way for this sort of free country and allow me to be who I want to be. And that's super awesome. And especially being a gay person, um, our country allows that. In some places, they don't have that liberty. And to travel across the entire country without any real restrictions. And in that in itself is amazing. At the end of the day, you know, we gave it, we gave it everything that we had. John wants this Philly back. Hey, Aaron, there's stuff that can break up. I'm trying to fucking be easy. No, you just throw in the fucking wet wipes. It's like a brick. He already right. dropped the gators. I didn't want to tell you. And I didn't want him to know. I know I saw it, but I did. Put the whole bag out of the car. They're, they're fragile, man. I'm, I'm sorry. They look at Go over there, I got a car wash. I don't see the car wash. It's right here. This is the car wash. Oh, oh, I didn't see that. Well, no, we're only like two miles, we're not 1.8 miles from my house. It's a home sweet home. 
We're here at Levi's, mom's house. Yeah. Like a wretched nomad. I'm just so excited that we got to do this, and I'm really excited that it went the way it went at the end of the day. It's 4.9 miles away. I can't believe it. I'm so glad you Missed you. Missed you too. Hey, look, my dad's taking video of me coming home. He's standing out in the driveway. Papa Restata! Uh, Lily Pillows have traveled across the country with us. 8,000 miles, not being washed. We should get a picture with them. I feel like they're symbolic. Let's <laughs> double man! Welcome home. <laughs> Did you guys have fun? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> you hesitated. <laughs> Hello! Welcome home. How are you? Good to see you guys. Mom! Can you Can you mom? Hi. Hi. I'm good, Aaron. I'm good! No, it's a good play. You talk really? Come here. Yeah. I want to talk to you. The fans want to know more. Shut up, Aaron. I'm done. And so there you have it, right where we started. You might be wondering what happened to Aaron. You know, the trusty camera lad. You see, he made it home safely, but needless to say, he'd had enough of filming for a while. Oh, and one last thing. Get inspired. <laughs>